introduced such uh, people like Mordechai Richler, Leonard Cohen, um, Saul Bellow, was born in Montreal, Drew Boyce, Charles Smuck, <laughs> and Jennifer Ross. Uh, so I know I know Jennifer since we went to Herbstein's Mishmar summer camp in the Laurentians, and St. Adolphe de Howard, Quebec. Um, that, that's where the introduction should be getting in for so, Jennifer currently works as a coordinator at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. This is run by, directed by Dory Gould, a very important um, think tank in Israel and Jerusalem. She's also doing her PhD at Bar Ilan University and has been an ISGAP research consultant for many years. She's published with us uh, several articles and working papers. Her publications include Marginalization and Its Discontents, American Jews, Multicultural and Identity Studies, and that was produced by the book that we were circulating here, uh, Global Antisemitism, A Crisis of Modernity, which was published by ISGAP. There's five volumes published by ISGAP, and a volume which Jennifer also appears in by Brill uh, Press. She wrote, in that, in that book, uh, an article including Missing from the Map, Feminist Theory and American Jewish Women, which is a very important paper, looking at um, the whole issue of multicultural identity, women's identity, Jewish women's identity, and the academy, and their kind of um, struggle that only Jewish women engage in, but I think also men, sort of uh, how to be a scholar and maintain or create a, a Jewish identity compatible with being in certain institutions and certain professions. So there's a struggle that we engage in, and, and Jennifer, I think very importantly and uniquely gave voice to a struggle that we all have, uh, but many people do not or have not or did not articulate, so her work is very important. So tonight, today, she's going to continue the discussion on issues of multiculturalism and identity and sort of the double-edged sword. So, Thank you very, very much. I want to thank ISGAP for uh, hosting me. Thank Charles for the invitation. Thank Jenny for uh, all of the coordinating that it took. And to thank Jasmine also uh, for, for all her help. And I'm really, really Jewish immigrants to America and their descendants so well has come at a price. We all know of the data that point to trends in American Jewry that suggest population decline. These findings have prompted numerous responses, including a concerted drive to research the state of Jewish identity. The driving motivation behind much of this research is a concern with Jewish survival in the face of not anti-Semitism and persecution, but the welcoming environment of American pluralistic society. The overall objective of these studies, whether stated or implicit, is the search of prescriptions to secure American Jewry's future. Recent decades have also seen a surge of academic inquiry in the fields of identity and multicultural theory, which have become among the most extensively studied constructs in the social sciences and historical research. Multicultural research, as you know, examines issues related to identity in a range of forms. Individual identity, collective identity, multiple identities, ethnic, gender, occupational, national, narrative, social, and more. My talk opens with a look at a curious area of omission in the drive to understand Jewish identity, namely 
its exclusively inward-looking focus of looking at Jews with next to no literature that explores Jewish characteristics in the context of Jewish impact on American society at large. We'll then look at a mirror image of this omission that exists in scholarship on multicultural identity, summarized in historian David A. Hollinger's observation, quote, the key point about multiculturalism is that there has been almost no place in it for Jews. We will also see that this omission certainly pertains to Jewish women when it comes to research and feminist identity studies. Part two of this talk puts forward where this research reticence may have originated, going back to American academia in the decades following World War II, when today's senior scholars were embarking on their academic careers. We will also note an intriguing parallel development of how American Jews in both academic and public life generated the very language that helped Jews in America, that helped present Jews to America, <coughs> enabling greater entrance and acceptance. Yet the omission of Jews, women and men, from American multicultural studies research leaves a gap in our understanding of American modernity, as well as in a fuller understanding of American Jewry. Can everybody hear me? So, Considering the imperative nature of research on Jewish identity, the goal of bolstering the future of American Jewry itself, one might think that scholars' examination of this topic would leave no stone unturned. Yet despite volumes of valuable research, which has looked at indicators of Jewish behaviors, attitudes, and affiliations, while weighing what they may portend for American Jewry's numbers and resilience, there are certain areas of omission due to which we lack a cohesive overall picture. One of these blind spots, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, concerns much of Jewish identity studies overwhelmingly inward orientation, overlooking what Deborah Kaufman referred to as the subjective byproduct of social location. Namely, we lack research on the context of Jewish identity within the American non-Jewish mainstream. To David A. Hollinger, by the way, is not a Jew, this inward view typifies what he called a communalist perspective, meaning what he called an emphasis on the history of communal Jewry, including the organizations and institutions that proclaim Jewishness and the activities of individuals who identify themselves as Jewish. This, as opposed to the dispersionist approach Hollinger advocated in order to rectify the disparity and to understand what he saw as the demographic overrepresentations of Jews in the American worlds of finance, film, science, psychoanalysis, philanthropy, political radicalism, modern, modernist movements in the arts, and other domains of modernity. He explained, by dispersionist, I refer to a more expanded compass that takes fuller account of the lives in any and all domains of persons with an ancestry in the Jewish diaspora, regardless of their degree of involvement with communal Jewry, and no matter what their extent of declared or described Jewishness. The skills promoted by the conditions of the European diaspora surely help explain many kinds of Jewish success. A large swath of American popular and professional discourse was led by people who carried Jewish cultural baggage with them in their creative careers, whether or not they identified themselves as Jews. This broadened framework of study, he claims, is in the interest of understanding both the overrepresentation and underrepresentation of different descent groups an approach also adopted by Yuri Sleskin, for example, who in his book, The Jewish Century, put forward the case that skills honed by centuries of life in the European diaspora paved the way for unprecedented Jewish impact over the course of the 20th century in America and elsewhere. The dispersionist perspective that Hollinger advocated rejects the more common course we might recognize as avoidance due to a perception that direct examination would invite anti-Semitic inferences. 
rather than opening the door to theories of Jewish domination or Jewish uh, genius, however, Hollinger says, the grounds for this reticence diminish, if not disappear, if these statistics can be explained by taking full account of the conditions under which the various descent groups have been shaped. Avoiding the forthright historical and social scientific study of the question perpetuates the mystification of Jewish history and subtly refuels the idea that the answer is really biological and will serve to reinforce invidious distinctions between descent groups. Turning his attention to multicultural studies, Hollinger pointed to a vacuum that is a mirror image of the communalist dispersionist dichotomy. The key point about multiculturalism, as I quoted him above, is that there has been almost no place in it for Jews, Hollinger says. Mainstream scholarship has been slow to recognize and appreciate Jewish history in relation to the larger prehistory and history of cultural diversity in America. One might think that this story, the impact of groups of Jews, would attract the attention of mainstream historians interested in the idea of identity formation and cultural diversity, which has been a huge preoccupation of American historians for the last 40 years. Instead, Hollinger contended that scholarship in multicultural and identity studies has discounted Jews, discounted American Jews, due to what he called an ethno-racial manner of mapping cultural diversity, which he dated back to the late 1970s, saying, Jews were ignored since the main point of multiculturalism was color, and the Jews were white. And the second point of multiculturalism was inequality, and Jews were doing very well. So cool it, the collegial message was, let these multicultural studies programs deal with the needs of Americans color-coded, in contrast to the white demographic bloc. It bears recalling here that Jews have only recently come to be considered white, Race has been a remarkably fluid form of categorization over the past centuries, with some referring to racial categorization as a social construct. As historian Sander Gilbert, Gil, Gilman noted, for the 18th and 19th century scientists, the blackness of the Jew was taken as fact and as mark of racial inferiority, in addition to an indicator of his diseased nature. By mid-century, being black, being Jewish, being diseased, and being ugly came to be inexorably linked. One bore the signs of one's diseased status on one's anatomy and by extension in one's psyche. Actually, literature documenting race in America dates the designation of Jews as white as recently as the 1920s or the period following World War II. With the awareness of Nazi Germany's racial policies and resulting horror, the 1940s produced a profound revision in the taxonomy of the world's races. This is reflected in examples such as Arthur Miller's 1945 novel, Focus, or Laura Z. Hobson's 1947, Gentleman's Agreement, later adapted into the film starring Gregory Peck, whose message was that Jews are not only difficult to tell apart from non-Jews, but that their similarity to real Americans reflects their essential worthiness of racial equality as well. Expanding this definition of whiteness brought obvious benefits to Jews within American society. This identification with mainstream white America positioned American Jewry to attain much greater financial security and power during the second half of the 20th century. At the same time, in sources much more recent, in the 1940s, Jews are described as not quite white, or a different shade of white. In other words, not quite blending in. A 1993 study involving white American women on the subject of their white identities by Ruth Frankenberg noted statements by Jewish participants indicating that several points must be made about the intersection of Jewishness and whiteness. Ashkenazi Jews for much, for much of this century in the U.S. and Europe have been placed at the borders of whiteness, at times viewed as cultural outsiders, at times as racial outsiders, but in any case never 
as constitutive of the cultural norm. Frankenberg's study is revealing in other ways as well. In the relatively short section she devoted to the Jewish aspect of those women among her participants who were Jews, the theme of experiencing anti-Semitism arose among every single one of them. Frankenberg picked up on statements by the Jewish women in her interviews which described their senses of identity as Jews over different stages in their lives, calling into question the ethno-racial mapping Hollinger cited that excluded the experience of American Jews as a topic worthy of attention in its own right within mainstream research. When it comes to Jewish women, consistent with Hollinger's observations, the intersection of their identities goes unnoticed within the general field of identity studies. When it comes to research examining gender identity, feminist and multicultural identity, Jewish women are practically absent as case studies. Such multiple exclusions, as Sarah R. Horowitz termed them, stand in marked contrast to the considerable literature in black feminist theory and that of other racial and ethnic groups. The omission of Jewish women from general multicultural research appears particularly curious in light of Jewish women's contributions to the feminist movement in the United States, both as activists and as leading theorists. Hollinger, in fact, cited the feminist movement as a prime example of the lacunae he observed in multicultural research. Quote, despite the over-representation of Jewish women among the ranks of its leaders by how many thousand percentage points, he noted, our scholarly and popular histories take virtually no notice of this astronomically huge demographic fact. Research asking, in what sense is women's liber liberation a Jewish story, Hollinger claimed, liking it to, likening it to the way scholarship has explored the role of Protestantism in the abolitionist and civil rights movements, would help streamline American, Jewry's, American Jewish history's integration into mainstream American history. Among rare examples of academic studies to examine the interface of identities for Jews within their non-Jewish social location is Joyce Antler's documentation of radical feminism in Jewish women, and she thus illustrates a redeeming approach. Revealingly, though, the movement leaders she interviewed had disregarded the possible association between being Jewish at the time of their activism during the 1960s and 1970s at the height of second wave feminism. Only much more recently, and in retrospect, had they begun to assert its relevance. Dina Pinsky added dimension to this chapter of history in her 2010 study inter interviewing 30 Jews, most of them women, on the subject of their Jewish identities and their involvement as activists in the women's movement during the same period. To give another telling example of what I'm trying to say, when subjects in Deborah Kaufman's 2005 study expressed sentiments to the effect to, uh, to the effect that their identity as Jewish women, quote, is grounded in their experiences in, as the other within Judaism. It spoke directly to the experience of being a Jewish woman vis-a-vis -vis Jewish men, as well as vis-a-vis -vis the greater world's perception of the Jew as other. These four studies, Frankenberg's, Antler's, Pinsky's, and Kaufman's, provide isolated examples of how much more may be gleaned in a more thorough probing of the intersection of Jewish women's identities. Their observations call attention to the material yet to be mined by studying the interface of Jewish identities within American society in multicultural identity literature. The rarity of research on Jewish women within mainstream multicultural research on the American feminist movement appears paradoxical. American Jewish scholars' failure to get Jews on the standardized multicultural, multicultural map of the United States, despite the heavy de demographic overrepresentation of Jews in the cultural industries, including academia, is all the more paradoxical. The reason for this block may stem in part 
from what Alan M. Kraut recalled as the chilling effect of an American academia in the post-war period as still rife with anti-Semitism. In the aftermath of the war, Kraut writes, unabashed Jew haters in the academy needed to keep more of a lid on their attitudes when speaking publicly. However, graduate students with professional aspirations still often hesitated to select a dissertation topic that identified them as Jewish. Wise doctoral mentors took careful care to counsel against a topic that typecast the young aspiring academic as too Jewish. Even those committed to writing history without Jews had an uphill battle, he observed. Jews specializing in American history had a particularly difficult time getting jobs. Historians were reluctant to entrust the teaching of the nation's sacred history to such outsiders. Examples of this aversion were given voice in my own dissertation research when American Jewish women, all senior members of faculty in the humanities or social sciences, described the process of choosing their academic field of research. Many upheld the, the same unwritten rule, spurning Jewish themes as a given, some stating pointedly that choosing such a focus would have been akin to opting for separatism as opposed to the career they sought in the mainstream. A professor, as a professor of American studies in, at Stanford University recalled her decision to forego a dissertation topic related to Yiddish, quote, if you viewed yourself as someone who wanted to live and work in an integrated environment, it really was not a viable option. But taking that intellectual drive and channeling it into the secular arena and excelling in the bastions of American learning, that was something we Jewish graduate students in the Ivy League could handle. A professor of English literature and women's studies at Berkeley articulated to me this sense of mutual exclusivity between Jewish topics and mainstream research when she spoke of the course syllabi she developed on women, race, and ethnicity, in which it never occurred to her to include Jewish perspectives, saying, I know of no one, certainly no one here at the university, who teaches Jewish women writers, or even Jewish writers, and that may be a coincidence. It may also have to do with concern about ghettoization. I'm not sure I would want to identify myself or be identified as someone circumscribed by a Jewish identification. Now, we come to an intriguing parallel development. In contrast to the above trend of demarcation between mainstream academia and Jewish topics of study, Lila Corwin Berman, in her 2009 book, Speaking of Jews, traced a very different development over the same general period, a phenomenon which functioned indirectly and almost surely inadvertently in countering marginalization. During the second half of the 20th century, Jews in academia, along with Jewish leaders, rabbis, and intellectuals, sought to generate a public language of presenting Jews to the United States as a means of navigating relationships with non-Jews within an open yet non-Jewish society. By creating this intellectual framework, Berman noted, Jewish leaders strove to make Jewishness intelligible to the American public. When properly conceived, she noted, a public language of Jewishness, instead of marking Jews as outside of or peripheral to American life, enabled Jewish leaders to define Jews as indispensable to the United States. Berman described the intensive involvement of Jews within the academy, particularly the social sciences, and their active role in creating both the theories and the very language of academic discourse. The Jewish attraction to the social sciences, she writes, was a response to the particular circumstances of minorities and Jewish life. Sociology offered minority groups an opportunity to integrate their experiences into larger national contexts. Sociological language and models became unrivaled sources of authority, sculpting the public language that American Jewish leaders used to talk about Jewishness. The fact that Jews helped mold the field of, the field of sociology is critical to understanding why sociological language became so useful in 
Jews' efforts to explain themselves to the United States. In other words, to Berman, Part of what secured American Jews' entrance and acceptance into academic life was the terminology they themselves crafted within emerging academic disciplines. Still, countering these gains are the gaps to which Hollinger pointed for when it came to American Jewry as the subject of academic research. The communalist emphasis on the one hand and the marginalization of Jews from mainstream topics on the other allowed the narratives of American history and American Jewish history to remain mutually exclusive. Yet one of the parallel effect he described, that large swath of American popular and professional discourse led by persons of Jewish ancestry or people who carried Jewish cultural baggage with them in their creative careers, how may this influence have disseminated into the American public sphere at large? An excerpt from the interview with the Stanford professor quoted above provides an example of how her contributions to academic discourse may have incorporated elements of her Jewish identity as she construed it. Describing her current academic venture, an international journal, she wondered, the journal has been a really fruitful area that I've gone into. Do I find this congenial because being Jewish makes me somehow or cosmopolitan focused or something? She surmised, I can't really say that I've had a sustained commitment to Jewish topics or Jewish intellectual concerns in my work, but in a sense, I like to feel that by doing the kind of scholarship that I do and by being kind of both bold and careful and trying to move things in fresh directions, I'm somehow carrying on in Jewish intellectual traditions, even though it's in a secular realm. I'd like to think of that. So we see that the mid 20th century pressures to which Crouch referred, where wise doctoral mentors curtailed their Jewish protege's academic areas of focus to exclude Jewish topics, imposed a doctrine of mutual exclusivity. The above interview excerpts reflect the kind of ingrained constraints that shaped academic careers as well as the fields of multicultural and identity research. Yet the excerpts also suggest the public language of Jewishness to which Berman referred, expressing that their secular areas of research may carry on Jewish intellectual traditions, indicates the degree to which Jewish academics work may implicitly carry blueprints rooted in Jewish experience elements traceable within their scholarship and ultimately in the public sphere beyond. The absence of Jews as subjects within mainstream academic research corresponds sharply with another form of invisibility that I've mentioned, that of Jewish women within the academic literature of feminist theory. As we saw, the marginalization of Jews stemmed from a barely concealed often baldly anti-Semitic aversion communicated to researchers setting out on their academic careers. A concurrent development, as we saw, was American Jews' leading contribution to social science theory and terminology, and terminology molding the field, in Berman's words, and thus enabling them to define Jews as indispensable to the United States. Perhaps ironically, the very fact of being defined into the mainstream, coupled with the prescribed color-coded cultural typologies which Hollinger described, may have swayed American Jewish feminists from developing distinct theoretical models and epistemological standpoints akin to black feminists. Any perceived inclinations to do so were whitewashed, if you'll pardon the pun. Yet, the absent feminist, feminist Jewish standpoint has signaled an element of homelessness, both theoretically and in actual reality. The late Paula Hyman observed that unarticulated and unnamed perspectives result in social, psychological, and spiritual malaise, as well as in vulnerability. I borrow a phrase uh, from, the liter from the feminist literary scholar Elaine Showalter and her image in an image from her essay, Feminist Criticism in the Wilderness. Without a theoretical basis, Jewish women have remained 
an empirical orphan in the theoretical storm rendering American Jewish feminist women's sense of belonging within the mainstream of the movement as ticklish, if not tenuous. In truth, the experience of feeling like a cultural outsider or other, as noted in Frankenberg and Kaufman's studies, is far from uncommon. Jewish targeted enmity often takes the form of anti-Zionism and hostility toward Israel. The, inter the interconnected nature of these two bigotries demonstrated by Ed Kaplan and Charles Small. In certain circles, in the academic world and beyond, the option of being a feminist and a supporter of Israel is rendered mutually incompatible, a contradiction in terms. Bereft of theoretical belonging or anger, or, or anchor, not even loyal, committed, and radical feminists are exempt from bias anti-Semitic innuendo and slurs. In conclusion, as we've seen, the ethno-racial mapping described by Hollinger, which defined American Jewry as part of white, white mainstream culture, complemented the Jewish reticence, he cited, the reticence to call attention to their own over-representation in so many facets of American life. The effective omission of Jews from multicultural and identity research as case studies in their own right leaves a gap in our understanding of American modernity. As in the case of Jewish women's absence from feminist theory, it leaves Jews, women and men, ill-equipped to address the not quite white status that remains unexplored and unarticulated. If the aim of studying Jewish identity is to channel understanding into securing American Jewry's future, and the aim of multi and if the aim of multicultural identity, uh, multicultural identity and feminist research is to shed light on how individuals of different racial and ethnic groups, including Jewish women and men, negotiate their respective standpoints, the time for addressing the gaps in academic research is long overdue. Heeding Hollinger's call to decipher matters such as to what degree is women's liberation a Jewish story, future studies can aim to trace the Jewish story within different academic canons and thus shed light on its impact on developments both within academia and beyond in the past century. By the same token, additional study to trace the American, the multicultural, or the feminist story within the life stories of American Jews would stand to add valuable dimension to what we would learn of their Jewish identities, the course of their development, as well as where anti-Semitism's impact has been salient. Such study will move toward integrating Jewish and mainstream research, adding dimension with which to understand more fully the American and American Jewish experience. Thank you for an excellent thought-provoking paper. So I, I, I want to ask you some challenging questions. So we're both born in Canada. Canada became a multicultural society in the 1970s. And multiculturalism, unlike the melting pot theory, puts emphasis on ethnic movement. It's encouraged. And I think that the evolution of Canadian Jewish identity in comparison to American Jewish identity now living in the United States for 10 years has started. There's a tremendous difference, even though you know, Montreal is 300 miles away from here. It's uh, it's another reality. So we have a, we have one national model which put emphasis on developing and maintaining group identity and group rights. The Canadian Constitution is based on group rights. The United States pushes notions of individual rights and freedoms and liberties, and as opposed to group rights, everybody's every individual is equal to the law and not groups. And there's a melting pot approach where the emphasis is, as you were saying in your paper, the Hollinger outlines, there's there's negativity associated with communalism and the whole Chicago School, a bunch of American social sciences when it comes to issues of ethnic identity places emphasis on seeing success as integration, assimilation. Yeah. Integration and assimilation. Seeing, seeing integration as success. 
Segregation is a sign ah. of deprivation, and integration, assimilation, disappearing from the communal is a sign of great success. So the American Jewish community has developed white identity. I hear it all the time. Whereas in Canada, it's rare to find Jewish people identifying as being white. Okay, and this is not a way. So my question to you is, I, and there's a tendency in, in studies to look at to look at those on the receiving end of power relations. To you know, we look African American segregation. We look at why you know we look at the African American community, and we 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 often do not put emphasis on the history of slavery, subjugation, segregation, Jim Crow. Etc. We just focus on the malaise, let's say, in the African American community when it comes to economic success, integration, assimilation. So my question to you is, why not put emphasis on the whole melting pot model? And I, I would say a sign of success is to be white and is to assimilate. So when you're in this society which is driving Jews in a certain area, why is that? Is that the failure of multiculturalism, or is that the success of the American model, and that the the progress of this community is to become white and to become assimilated, to become American. So, are you pointing at so what? So, what's going on? So, so the so the the voice that's missing of Jews in the academy and Jewish women in the academy may mean a mark of success and the accomplishment of the objective of the society. Yeah, and, and that's what, um, that's one, one thing that, that's a point that comes up when, um, when I, when, when one points out why isn't there the same, why isn't there a parallel literature of uh, Jewish feminist uh, identity uh, studies? Literature as there is in Latina and studies. Um, one answer could be because we didn't need to. There was no need to. Uh, but the fact is that um, that it's not really the case. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I agree with you about Canadian Jews not seeing themselves as white, but, I, but, there's, but at the same time, I think they see themselves as distinct from, from, the, from the loss majority, and, and never ever as being indistinguishable. But, but, but legally, Jews are different than French and Anglos, I guess I believe it. Constitutionally, Jews are different. In this country, it's absolutely the opposite. Yeah, yeah. This may be a very good thing, uh, legally speaking, and, and it's worked. It's worked. It served the Jewish community in America very, very well in many ways. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that if one is left without a language to, to the, the fact of the matter is, if one, if there is no way in which one can a card-carrying, radical, radical feminist in many, many uh, circles of the women's movement. It's becoming much more mainstream. Um, and, and you see this both in, in rhetoric and in programming within the women's movement. It's hard to be part of that mainstream and still be uh, a very vocal supporter of Israel. Then, then what, why is that? What are Jews classified of in, in, in Canada? So, the, so, so just very briefly, the, the, the Canadian Constitution is based on group rights. And there was this Royal Commission inquiry or commission on, on um, the, founding, uh, the founding ethnic groups of Canadian society. And it stipulates that, and this is my language, I'm speaking in front of an expert on gender studies, but I'm choosing my words, this is the Canadian law. The founding fathers of confederation are the are the are the, um, the, the ethnic uh, people of ethnic uh, origin of, of France and of, of Britain. So 
The founding fathers of Confederation are British and French uh, people of ethnic origin, and all others are considered other. And other should only exist for statistical compilation. But then, when the Canadian government um, adopted the Bill of Rights and the uh, Freedom Charter, group rights, not just the British and French group rights, but all other group rights were enshrined in the Constitution. So the Canadian government subsidizes Jewish organizations, Jewish education, and other groups' education. So the Canadian government recognizes group rights as a fundamental aspect of its constitution and its, and its law. And the United States, with the melting pot theory, it's the exact opposite, it's individual rights. I mean, my daughter went to school at McGill, so, and I never heard this. I never heard her mention it. I never heard it. It's so fascinating. So, so legally, you were considered uh, an ethnic group, which is part of the, the so law. So Jews are Jews. So, and, we're, and it stipulates that we're not Anglophones, Francophones, or we're, we're part of the other ethnic groups. So even though my first language, is, and our, your first language is English, and we're both relatively bilingual, we're, we're, we're not considered um, Anglophone according to the Canadian Constitution and law because we come from a different <coughs> We're Jews. So even though our first language is English, we're not And you were born Anglophone. in Canada. Pardon? And you were born in Canada. I was born in Montreal. So, so you different. still, and you said, that's so interesting. You, you're considered other than? We're considered other. You're not considered, considered Canadians, by, I mean, first. We're Canadians. Canadian oh, citizens, but, but not English. That's, that's, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Now there are some. I'm, I'm sure. sure. Yeah. <coughs> How do you self-identify? Are you a Jewish Canadian or Canadian Jew? <laughs> the more Canadians would identify, I believe, and I, I, I studied this too, and I don't know if Jennifer may disagree, and she's the speaker, but I think more Canadians would say that they are Jewish or Sikh or, or whatever and then before Canadian. they're Canadian. And in America, as do you think Americans are different? The United States. Because America's from Chile to Canada, but in the United States, most people say American, American first. Right, right. That's my impression. That's me. That I'm an American Jew. Canadians will say that they're trying right. Canadians. Right. So that's the difference between the Jews and Canada and America. One are Jewish Canadians, the other are American Jews. <laughs> Jews are Jews. Yeah. Canadians are Jewish Canadians. Yeah. 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 You and Charles were speaking about your childhood and your introduction, Charles. So, I'll, Charles. so I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Yay. And in Brooklyn, everyone used to ask each other, what are you? Oh, yeah? That was a standard question. Right. Yeah. What are you? Right. In other words, where are your parents from, right? Yeah. You're Italian, you're Irish, you're Swedish. Mm -hmm. My old neighborhood in Brooklyn used to be a Scandinavian neighborhood. Lo and behold, years go by, I become an immigration officer. And I'm a passport control officer, and everybody then tells me who they are by handing me their passport. And the federal government, now I'm a federal officer, is constantly asking me on forms, uh, if I put in for a promotion or whatever, what am I? Really? Right? Am I black? Am I an Alaskan? Am I an Aleutian? Am I? So I always said other. And I check my race as what? Hebrew. And so why? Category? No, it's other. I do what I want. Why do I put other? Because Albert Einstein, excuse, yes, Albert Einstein, naturalization certificate, and I'm a citizenship and immigration officer, in his race, said other, it says Hebrew. He's a, he, he's, that's his race. So I always say, well, if it's good enough for Albert Einstein, it's good enough for me. So that's what I check off other. So that's my, what I just wanted to share that with you. I always check other in this country. Too. I have an easy time Hispanic. <laughs> you have it easy, right? Yeah, Hispanic. I used to be married to a Jew. Impossible. Hmm. That's why I'm here. <laughs> yes. This might be an anecdotal observation. When I was working in Russia, uh, and I was asking, uh, where is he from? Where was she coming from? And they were saying, well, he's from Ukraine. The other one is from uh, uh, 
St. Petersburg, and the other one is a Jew. Mm -hmm. Never said which city mm -hmm. and oh. what part yeah. with the religion that identified them. Yeah. As far as the Canadian uh, law is concerned, actually in the uh, Constitution of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran uh, that I, I translated, there is a specific paragraph on the uh, religions that are uh, recognized, and uh, one of them is the uh, Jewish religion. It's academic. Well. <laughs> I suppose it's not always good to be. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I'm, I, do you, uh, that's what I was thinking. I mean, I, th I think there's a conflict of interest almost to be recognized or not. And it seems, you know, the, the pluralism or blending in, the kind of getting this invisibility is kind of like the white privilege in a sense. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and perhaps women do value that, especially feminists kind of chose that route in a sense to value I don't know that they, like there that there was this privilege associated with invisibility in some some way, and that that's why feminists and Jewish feminists in a certain sense rejected embracing the you know um, being an ethnic group. Um, it's I, I mentioned a study of, uh, of Ruth Frankenberg's that looked that interviewed I don't remember exactly how many uh, women. Topic was looking at their white identities and white identity studies is a field in itself, but it's it's kind of a Johnny come lately, or Julie come lately, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's sort of a reaction uh, to all of the other uh, ethnicity and, and race identity studies. Uh, so you know how you know you think of this bland white bread, but there's of course it's much more, much more textured. Yes. I guess my question is, uh, do we really want a J on our passport? Uh, uh, it's, you know, to, me, to me, it's you know, reminiscent of Nazi Germany or uh, even contemporary Russia or you know, maybe, maybe Soviet Union. Um, and isn't it really more a question of us identifying ourselves rather than the government identifying us, or? Uh, yeah, I would say, I, I think that that, the, the, that question could be developed very well in a seminar that Charles chooses to give at some later date, nationalism and citizenship and identity. Um, what, the, what my, what I was speaking about is exactly that, and, and the reticence Looking at, it, there's a lot of uh, navel gazing. Some, some people would call the Jews' obsession about you know, Jewish identity and how observant are you of, of, of these customs and of those traditions and of these, you know, who are your friends and where you socialize. Um, but, but, but looking at the much greater picture, what, what Hollinger called to us widening the compass and, and looking at uh, American society and American modernity and, and seeing everything we can talk about it, but the, the tremendous Jewish presence and all of it, but not really study. You know, what is what is it about the Jews, the Jewish characteristics that may have contributed to this disproportionate presence. We sometimes cite it with great pride, and, and but sometimes there's a lot of reticence. And he and he speaks about this avoidance, a tendency toward avoidance that I think we all recognize, not wanting to call too much attention to this, this you know, don't you don't want to draw too much attention to characteristics that you know could work out to be not so much in our favor. And he, and he says, no, we should boldly examine what was it about the conditions about in the European diaspora, which when you're talking about American Jewry, the vast, vast majority come derived from the European diaspora, uh, that, that may have cultivated certain characteristics. Um, but, there, but there is that reticence. I, 
a friend recently said uh, to me uh, you know, in the course of a conversation that uh, Jews love to talk about other Jews. So, and I guess I was talking about other Jews at the time, or just, you know, make it, just making observations. Um, Non-Jewish person. Um, who, who just, you know, actually comes from Louisiana, just came recently to New York, and has started associating with Jewish people, and has noticed kind of a trend that Jews love to talk about other Jews. Uh, so I don't know how that fits in exactly with, with your talk, but uh, but and, and what, what about what about the uh, the pop culture things like Jewish sports heroes or Jews in Jewish Hollywood stars? Are are Jews the only ones who buy these books, or uh, uh, you know, or is this? Uh, the publishers I mean, is, who publish them must take into account who is going to buy them. So I suppose. I, I, I mean, isn't isn't that a sign of Jewish self-identification and saying, well, we're you know, uh, Sandy Koufax didn't pitch on on Yom Kippur. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, this is this, this is what you hear growing up as you know. As, you know. I think that's an important. That's a that's an interesting distinction. I think like. In Lay terms, we we enjoy talking about it, and it's you know it's sort of common knowledge. But in the academy, okay, it's not it's not it hasn't okay. been looked at. It hasn't it hasn't been studied and I mean, cast under a microscope. I, you know, again, in, po in terms of pop culture, you know, the the the, the outside the outsized effect of Seinfeld and. Uh, um, Losing his name, uh, uh, Larry, David. Larry David. Thank you from 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 my from my old neighborhood of Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. Uh, so they, I mean, their out their outsized effect on American culture is uh, is huge. Uh, so I think in the realm of you know, so I guess what you're referring to is more of the, the academy. Yeah, I mean, your friend from Louisiana, if you go by Lenny Bruce, he's now Jewish. Yeah. New York is Jewish. Hmm. Right. Um, regarding visibility, um, for many years, um, before and after the war, um, the Jews didn't want to be visible. But only the last, I don't know, 30 years or so, there's more of a, a change. And they want to be visible more. Yeah. And regarding identity, um, when people ask me, you know, where's your family from? I said, their family's from Poland, but I'm Jewish. Meaning, I'm not Polish, I'm mm -hmm. Jewish. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I don't consider myself Polish ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I really, when I came across the book of Lila Corwin, speaking with Jews, and she was talking about a period just prior to what you were speaking about, mid-century, and the, the development of the fields of the social sciences of these of mm -hmm. Jews, creating the frames of reference, the creating the, the terms of the whole field of sociology that explained minorities, and that they defined themselves into the norm. Um, so like that uh, perhaps laid the ground the decades where it's much more fashionable. And you can't exclude also the, um, the 60s and the 70s, the, the Black is Beautiful movement, which ushered in the, the, the rise of ethnicity, crime and ethnicity all around, including those of the Jews. I think you, I, I understood that you mentioned that a lot of the Jewish social scientists um, got into that field because they were a minority. Um, I wonder if there are other, if that isn't like the main reason. I always believe that also, but I have a feeling it's not, it's much, more it's not specifically what I said, but it, I wouldn't be surprised if much of what drew them to those fields was the opportunity to describe themselves or it, but in the context of of the broader form. Yes. It seems that uh, nowadays, still, uh, in the academy, the academic uh, area, 
you still have the Shashtil mentality carried over from was so dangerous in the Second World War, which never got yeah. things accomplished. And still among Jews, there's a, a fear of calling attention yeah. to themselves and wanting to fit in. Yeah, yeah the, the scholars whom I mentioned were were really uh, eye-openers to me because they really speak out where very few do. Phyllis, Phyllis Chesler made a very interesting journey. Sure. She was a pioneer in feminism and then she there clearly has been an ongoing stream of Jewish feminism over, say, the last 40 years, most of which would seem to be aimed at raising the profile of Jewish women within Judaism and within the Jewish community. In your research and your work, have you found any exceptions to that where there's Jewish feminist studies that look more outward at you're, you're, you're writing the introduction to the dissertation. <laughs> there's, there's huge, huge, huge uh, literature on what I call Jewish feminism, which talks about Jewish women within the Jewish world, vis-a-vis -vis Jewish men, Jewish, uh, Jewish women's involvement in ritual and in and, uh, and community leadership. Um, and it's very, very important. It's very, very important. As, as far as it goes, there's very, very little that talks about the interface using the same kinds of methodologies as the other groups do, and, and, and that's what that's what brought this paper into being. Why, why might that be, and why? You know, this it isn't a paper about anti-Semitism, and here I am. Is gap, you know what? It's, it, but it is about the peculiar nature of the Jews. They're just this strange case. Hmm. So if I may, so I'm gonna, if I may, I was gonna ask the, my a crude question, following up on your question. So it's interesting. So the, the, the from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the feminist writing on, on the Jewish community. My understanding has been sort of critical of Jewish communal practices. You say feminist writing, you're Jewish feminism of the Jewish, critiques yeah. of the Jewish mm -hmm. community, the role of men, the role of women, the communal life, et cetera, et cetera, has been critical, I, I, I would say. And yet, these same writers seem to hesitate to be critical of American power relations and the role of the community in the United States. Well, and if so, why? I would say you're not entirely right. I would say many of these Jewish feminists uh, who were critical of, uh, of, of, the, of the current uh, of traditional Judaism criticize it as a patriarchal structure, uh, analogous to patriarchal society in our civilization at large. And will they look at anti-Semitism in American society? Uh, so this is what I mean, to be critical, to look critically, if you're going to look from, from a Jewish perspective inward, can you look from a Jewish perspective outward? That's, that's, a, very, that's a very good question. Some of those women, what, um, their driving passion is, is not necessarily the, the parallel phenomenon of anti-Semitism, although they can be, they can be passionate Sexism Jews. And many black feminists had, had the courage and the clarity of vision in developing their epistemological standpoints of recognizing that concurrently we need to be as aware of the sexism within African American society as you need to be aware of racism within American society. Why is there no such feminists? Why is there no 
don't have as much right as the and, and that's And that's why I, um, I loved the quote of this, uh, this literary scholar, uh, Lynn Showalter, who spoke about women as uh, a literary orphan in a theoretical storm. Orphan in a theoretical storm. An empirical orphan in a theoretical storm. She, she wasn't speaking about Jewish women at all. She was speaking about women, that women are invisible when it comes to literary theory. This is only that many, many decades, but it, it applies in my reading uh, to Jewish women as empirical orphans in a theoretical storm. What does that mean? That you know, there's a storm, a flood of, of theories. Feminist literary theory, feminist sociological theory, feminist psychological theory, historical theory, every every which way, and and doing a very worthy and important theory. But if it doesn't, and it's and it is rectifying, it has rectified a certain imbalance in the academy, which in which women were heretofore uh, were invisible. But, but if, if Jewish women uh, don't have any visibility, or if they, you know, if, well, you're white, so why, you know, what's the problem? You know, there's nothing to say. Or, and many, and many American Jewish women, and I would say European Jewish women to a degree, and Israeli feminist women would also say we don't have, that's the same claim of being white, uh, Ashkenazi Israeli women. Uh, it's not exactly true. How could it be true if, uh, if when it comes to issues like Israel or when it comes to theological feminism when, when um, I'm now getting into something Far, far afield, but if um, when, when Judaism, and the, the, the patriarchal uh, Judaism is, is, is viewed as the Christ killer in, in and you know, killing the goddess off, it's, it's, it's very, not very well masked anti Semitism. And, uh, and yet, there hasn't been this development of feminist theory, and that's very much what brought me to try to shed a little light on it. I just wanted to comment that there is somewhat of a parallel. Uh, people who don't identify as feminists, so many women don't identify at all as feminists who say there's no need for it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like um, the sexism has become almost invisible. I have a friend who's like, I, what? The, they didn't pass the equal equal rights in it, or they didn't pass like equal pay for equal work, huh? Like it's, it seems so obvious, but it's like an invisible um, mechanism, similar that a lot of people think that, that, that anti-Semitism, they, they don't think that it's something that they need to fight because they, they don't see it as in, in the United States. It's not like uh, the same way that, I was just saying that the parallel, the same way women say that they don't need feminism, People say they don't need to fight anti-Semitism. It doesn't, I, I don't see it. I mean, and it's kind of like not, I just feel like it's not uncovering um, the, the inner workings of and operations of the way that people. I want to give that, I want to give that more thought just to see how, how well that parallel holds because I haven't, I haven't really considered it. I, I just thought of it just now because I do have a lot of friends who are like, I don't feminism. Who needs that? It's, mm -hmm. it's over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I just have a question about anti-Semitism being directed. I have a feeling that it's directed more towards men than it is towards women. Did you ever find that? Are the men bankers, the economy, how they 
they, they control the banks, they control the money. It's more directed towards men. I think I know what you're referring to. Have you ever heard of Jack jokes? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't let my kids tell, or I, I, I say that's racist, and I don't, I don't like any kind of racist jokes. You know, it's, it's very different. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not like the, the banker or the schnorrer or the, but, um, but it still depicts a materialistic. It's very different, and, and it's not, you know, it's not what you would see if they're Sturmer, you're right. But, uh, but that's an American. But I think, it, I still think it's more intense towards them, if not completely. Maybe. Maybe. And it might ha also have to be with men being the more universal, and, and women being the other, still. Some of the expressions of it are an anathema to me. I cannot stomach them. But I think all of them. And that's, that was something that, um, what I couldn't understand was why there weren't more feminists. We were talking about this earlier. Why there weren't more feminists in my circle of friends who didn't see that there was just an obvious parallel between the self-determination movement of women and the self-determination movement of the Jews, Zionism. Why, the, why one, why Zionism seemed well parochial, not as cool sometimes, one more shashtil sometimes, and, and feminism. Take a look at the recent um, discussion in America about women um, putting on to feeling and um, the discussion that's been going on here. And then how, the, how does that uh, impact you? Because that's a very, you know, that's a very clear cut case of how the religion has kind of tended to differentiate these genders. Yeah. So for example, women are not obligated to attend a synagogue. Right. So that's a very great distinction, gender distinction. And women have historically never uh, put on to film. Not never, but very rarely so, yeah. Right. So those are very, very clear-cut ritual, where there are certain rituals that are very specific to men and very specific to women. Yeah, time-bound rituals. Well, uh, this is a this is an area of expertise that, as your president says, is not my pay grade. Okay. <laughs> it's there's a lot that could be said, and there's very there are very important statements about it. Yeah. This also, so I guess this also ties to the moral distinction you were saying earlier about having a J in your passport by recognizing group identity. And so, so in my studies comparing French and British colonialism, the French were all about assimilation. So assimilation is, could be good. Maybe the United States forms of assimilation or integration is a positive thing. But assimilation in its extreme form is a, is a form of cultural genocide. 
And then segregation, group rights can be a wonderful thing. A strong Jewish identity, I think, is a great thing compared to assimilation and losing you know, generations of kids to, uh, to the greater society. I think maintaining Jewish identity is important. But, you know, group rights and distinctions can lead to apartheid, can lead to all kinds of bad things in its extreme. And um, so, so I think it's a, I don't know, I think it's about power, power relations, where people fit into society. Um, and I would even say, uh, and the gender differentiation, assimilation to its, ex to its extreme, I think is ridiculous, but segregation to its extreme is also uh, a form of hatred. So. But it, what you're saying, maybe in another way. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, who knows, you know? I, I, I've, I've lived enough years to, that the question crosses my mind that gendered Judaism, you know, who am I to knock it? There could be a lot going for a system that's gendered. And on the other hand, uh, a woman or a person uh, feeling invisible. Uh, and, and, and that person's experience of it and uh, an exclusion and invisibility, if that's an authentic, true feeling and, and not, you know, not a contrived feeling, but, you know, not, who am I to knock that either? So I'm very happy that have to put down a It's not for me to say. I speak on a tangent, but we're small enough group. There was a scholar from Berkeley, California, the University of uh, Berkeley, speaking on food and nutrition. I forget his name. He gave a brilliant lecture. I have it on YouTube. And he was showing how food production in this country is getting out of hand. Consuming food is not healthy, it's radiated, and processed, and preservatives and food enhancers, taste enhancers, all this stuff. And he was explaining how in the 1970s, Kentucky Fried Chicken had a huge billboard and advertisement campaign in favor of women's liberation. And he explains how the food industry made the link that cooking at home is a form of uh, gender slavery. And to be liberated, you eat out and eat this, you know, processed pigeon. No, so so you know, so with the liberation of women and and, and he shows how families, poor families who cook at home are healthier than wealthy people who eat out in the United States. Anyway, so you know, so liberation means or you know, liberation from what or for what or just that face off. I don't know. Yeah, and, and that's Cooking shouldn't be a woman's thing, but we look down on home cooked food in society. It's dangerous. It's unhealthy. Cooked food is good. Which truth interests are driving uh, these things? Um, well, I think the question of the cigarette industry and the tobacco industry. Um, I think that's something that we're very similarly, the, the cigarette industry, the tobacco industry, oh, yeah. promoted um, smoking yeah, as. But going back to the 20s, and I think yes. it was um, Bernays, I think, who, and who had women marching at the head of the Easter parade, smoking, to show that women can be equal to men. Uh, mm -hmm. So... <laughs> right. just, Those are capitalistic mechanisms, right? Yeah. Well, it's advertising. Yeah, I mean, they'll utilize anything to make money, I think. I mean, like... Jennifer's articles are available on the second floor, actually. She published two with us.